But what happened to make the human brain take off? What was the equivalent of the mouse, the thing that made our species leap forward in the way that it did? Well, it has to be largely guesswork. About three million years ago, when our ancestor Australopithecus roamed about Africa, his brain was no bigger than that of a chimpanzee. This again is Australopithecus. And if this ancestor of ours had met a chimpanzee, they would have been on roughly equal terms as far as brains are concerned. Either of those species, any ape species at that time, could have been the one that took off. But the whole point of talking about self-feeding spirals is that to begin with, there won't be anything very dramatic. One of those species made some kind of minor breakthrough in software, some software advancement, I'm suggesting. The result of that wasn't seen till much later. You wouldn't have seen anything for a while. It would have gone into a spiral and eventually reached the heights that we have now reached. But I still haven't said what the software innovation was that sparked it all off. We don't know and we can only guess. One possibility is an improvement in our ability to simulate models of the world. We've seen that our brains make a model of what's actually going on in the real world. But we also know that they can make models of what might be going on in the world. Our ancestor, Homo erectus, was lived oh, um, a, a, a million years ago. And let's imagine that a particular female Homo erectus was trying to solve the problem how to get her family across a gorge like that. Nobody had ever built a bridge before. Bridge technology wasn't around. But she suddenly saw in her mind's eye a tree fallen across the gorge. And she realized that it could function as a bridge. She also thought, how can I get that to happen? And she imagined, she saw in her imagination, a fire at the base of the tree. She had the idea of burning the tree down to make it fall and make a bridge. Now this, of course, is entirely speculation. We don't know if that ever happened. We don't even know if it would have worked. The point I'm making is that she had a model in her head of a tree fallen across a gorge with fire, and that something hadn't yet happened. She was anticipating something that might happen in the future. And if you can do that, you've got a trick that's really worth having, because you can solve problems that other animals can't solve. So that's one possibility. Imaginative simulation may have been the software trick that took our species off. Another possibility is language. It's often been suggested, it's an obvious suggestion, because language seems tailor-made to get a piggyback spiral going. If you've got language, then each generation can learn from its predecessors, learn from the previous generation, learn from their mistakes, build on their experience. So maybe it was language. Unfortunately, there's a snag, there's some evidence that, um, uh, that language in the form of speech, at least, proper speaking, didn't arise until after the ballooning of the brain. But perhaps we can get out of that by suggesting that language had uh, an early apprenticeship in the form of a kind of sign language or drawing in the sand. Or perhaps uh, language arose before actual speech arose as a sort of way of talking to yourself, to get your thoughts into a logical order, to plan your actions in a logical order. And only later, perhaps, did it become externalized in the form of speech using the tongue, lips, and voice, so that brains became, as it were, networked together. We can also think of technology, tools, say, like these tools here, as external devices used by brains for extending the power of the hands, or other devices like telescopes and microscopes as devices for extending the power of the eye. Maybe it was technology that proved, that provided the breakthrough for humans to take off. So we've identified imagination, language and technology as three possible candidates for our trigger innovation. And perhaps all three played a role. Perhaps they reinforced each other in a three-way spiraling explosion. But each of those three mental tools, imagination, language, and technology, is double-edged. If we use them aright, we can perhaps end up making a model of the universe. But the double edge is always there. Take imagination and the brilliant simulating software that we saw earlier. 
It can be immensely useful, but it can also have unfortunate consequences. A brain that's good at simulating models in imagination, things that aren't there, is unfortunately also, almost inevitably, in danger of self-delusion. How many of us have lain in bed, terrified, because we thought we saw a ghost or a monstrous face staring in the bedroom window, only to discover eventually that it was just a trick of the light, the moonlight playing on the curtains. We've seen from Charlie Chaplin how easy it is, how eager the brain is to make a face, even when, that, when there's only a, a hollow back to a mask. That same software can do the same trick if it sees some folds in the curtain that just happen to suggest eyes and nose and a mouth, perhaps. So we see a face when there isn't one there. Every night of our lives we dream. That same simulating software sets up worlds that don't exist, people, animals, countries that never existed, perhaps never could exist. At the time, we experienced those simulations as though they were reality. And why shouldn't we? Given that we habitually experience reality in just the same way, by looking at simulation models in our heads. The simulation software can delude us when we're awake, too. So I think the lesson from this is that if ever we hear a story that somebody has seen a vision, been visited by an archangel, heard voices in his head, we should be immediately suspicious. Secondly, language. What's the downside of that? Why is that a double-edged sword? Well, good information can spread around the world, around the network of brains very easily, but so can everything else. It doesn't have to be good. Even something as trivial as this. Ten years ago, you never saw anyone going around with a baseball cap on backwards. In fact, in this country, you never saw anyone with a baseball cap on at all. But now, if you go down a street, either in this country or America, you almost can't help seeing a young man with a baseball cap on backwards. The reverse baseball cap has spread like chickenpox, first in America, then here. It's a mind epidemic, a kind of virus of the mind. And like a chickenpox epidemic, epidemics of mind viruses also, I'm glad to say, die out remarkably quickly. And my guess is that before very long, the reverse baseball cap will go the way of this. Well, baseball caps and turtles are, of course, harmless. But there are other more powerful idea systems that are more sinister and that do actively hold back progress towards our understanding of the universe. In 1633, the Holy Inquisition condemned Galileo Galilei, the great Italian physicist, to life imprisonment. His crime was to publish a book arguing correctly that the world moved round the sun. He was condemned on vehement suspicion of heresy because his science contradicted the beliefs of the dominant culture of his time. And don't let's be complacent about our time. It's in our time that an entire religious sect has been actively incited by its leaders to murder a distinguished novelist because he wrote a book that was seen as threatening the verbally handed down beliefs of that sect. And it is in our century, too, that perhaps the most pernicious language virus ever known was spread. There's no need for me to add words there. <laughs>